Welcome to Liberty. We're so glad that you chose to come and worship with us this morning. If you're new here, we'd like to say thank you for joining us and tell you a little bit about what you can expect. Here at Liberty, we have a simple threefold purpose. Love God, serve others, and preach the gospel. For us, that means not only gathering on Sundays, but then showing the love of God by serving our community every single day. If you have kids, we have the perfect place for them to get plugged in. On Sundays and Wednesdays, our kids and teens have classes designed just for them where they are learning what it means to follow Jesus and love others with the love of Christ. If you have small children, we have nurseries available. Our staff of trained, background-checked workers will provide a safe, loving environment for them while you're enjoying our worship service. In addition to these classes, we also have a thriving Spanish ministry that meets right next door on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Here in just a moment, our worship service will begin. We'll have a time of singing and prayer, followed by a message brought straight from the Bible. At the end of that message, we'll have what is called an invitation. This is an opportunity for everyone to pray or for you to come and speak to one of our counselors if you have any questions about the teaching you just heard or about following Jesus in general. Now silence your phone and find your seat as our service is about to begin. Good morning, Liberty family. The Bible says by the grace of God that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Sing about his grace this morning. Please stand and we will praise the name that is worthy this morning, the name of Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. Sing it now. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. promise good to me. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my whole secures. He will my shield and portion me as long yeah, right. as life. Lift it up, my chains are gone. My chains are gone. Your grace is more. 
Everybody's singing it now. Holiness, Holiness is Christ, Christ in me. Lift it up another level to the Lord now. He's worthy now. Come on. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour. Every hour I need you. My Lord. this morning that can testify that this song is true. This song is true this morning. Lord, I need you. Let's go to that second stanza where sin runs deep. Your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Think about the words as you sing it now to the Lord Jesus. Where sin runs deep. Where sin runs deep. Come on, church. Your grace is more. Where grace is Thank you for joining us this morning. I don't want to take for granted the privilege that it is to gather corporately. We saw earlier this year where uh, things changed and we weren't together corporately for some time. And every Sunday I'm reminded of what a privilege and blessing it is. There are so many churches that for one reason or another are not gathering in this way. And I'm thankful for a church family that's able and willing to gather. We can sing together and encourage one another. For those that are watching us on our live stream this morning, we welcome you to our service. And uh, we truly do need the Lord. The Bible says, Jesus told his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. Now, we always need him, but we don't always realize we need him. Sometimes in our own self-righteousness and our own self-sufficiency, we start to think we have it together. But there are certain events and seasons of life that sometimes remind us. They don't increase our need for him, but they remind us and, of the realization of our need for him. And there are some, I believe, in our church that are probably going through that right now. Uh, just early this morning, one of our longtime faithful members, Brother Leonard Young, passed over onto the other shore. He's in heaven this morning. I was with Gina and Leonard in the hospital last night for a couple of hours there in Harbor City. Gina hadn't been able to be by his side since March because of COVID. And the doctors told her yesterday that she could come. They knew that the, that the time was short. And I was able to be there and spend some sweet time They've been traveling through these health trials for about a little over two years. He had a stroke a little over two years ago and then a heart attack two days before Thanksgiving. He hasn't been out of the hospital since last Thanksgiving. And in those two years, this family and our church, they've walked through that trial with such great grace and Christian strength. I'm reminded of the verse the psalmist said in Psalm 116, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Leonard was brought up in the nursery of First Baptist Church in Long Beach. His family brought him up in church. And from the nursery to the grave, he stayed faithful to his Lord. What a great testimony. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I would ask if you would, this morning and this week, keep their family. Gina, of course, teaches in our Christian school, has taught there for many years. Anna, their daughter, teaches in our school. Evan, their son, is a junior in our school and youth group. And Alan and Aaron and Ryan. Andy, who is home from college to see his dad and, and be with his mom this weekend. Let's keep all of them in our prayers, if we will, this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for them and for our service together, shall we? God, I do thank you for the promise, the reality of heaven. I thank you for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the encouragement of a, of a church family that will walk through difficult d days like this with loved ones. And right now I'm asking, dear God, that you would please give great comfort and strength to Gina. Lord, for Alan and, 
and Andy and Anna and Evan who are all here and then Ryan and Aaron who are out of state, I pray that you would comfort their hearts this day. Would you be very near to each one? Give them grace they've not needed before and God help our church family to rally around them in the weeks, the months, the years to follow. I pray that we would, we would be a, a help and an encouragement. And God, I pray that each one of us would realize that Lord, before too long, we're gonna take that same journey if we know you as Savior that our dear brother Leonard has taken. God, help us to use the days that you've given us for your glory. And I pray now for the service to follow, that you would speak to hearts, you would, you would minister to our hearts, you would use the singing and the preaching, the praying, dear God, to, to do that which you want to do in our lives, Lord. And our lives, our homes, our church, our state, our nation, our world has so many needs. And God, we look to all different places to meet those needs, but the reality is you are the way, the answer. You are the truth that we're seeking. You are the life, and God, today may we draw closer to you is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated right there. As you're seated, I'm going to invite Norma to come here into the baptistry. And Ralph and Norma began coming to our church. I think this is your third Sunday here at Liberty. Is that right, Norma? I'm looking for where you can have a seat right here, where, where, uh, where Ralph is sitting. I'm looking right out there where he's sitting. I, I'm, wave at me. Wave at, oh, there he is right back there. Ralph and Norma, they came to Liberty about three weeks ago. And, uh, and Norma's been recently saved and uh, wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. It's my honor to baptize you this morning. I'm thankful the Lord led you to liberty. And uh, God is blessed in this season of COVID, of some uncertain times. God has brought hundreds of first-time guests over the last three or four months with many of those um, uniting with our, our Lord in baptism and uniting with our church in membership. And we're thankful for God's blessing through this unique season. Norma, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior? Upon that profession of faith, here, I'll have you cover your, hold your nose. Upon that profession of faith and in obedience to our Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That's a wonderful decision. I'm proud of you to let you go right up here to Miss Peggy. At this time, the ensemble is going to sing a beautiful song. How can it be? Think about the words as you hear it. How can it be that God would love someone like you and someone like me and thank God for his grace and his mercy this morning.
That's right. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many that bless you this morning? Amen. Praise his name. Let's stand. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing it out to the Lord now. What can wash away? What can wash away? Precious is the flow. but the blood of Jesus. Lift it up now, church. For my part of this I see nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, yes. For my cleansing. For my cleansing is my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. Sing it on that first answer now. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Everybody in the house this morning, lift your voice. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Name above all names. Think about this. Blessed Redeemer. Blessed Redeemer. Yeah, here he is. Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. The rest. The ransom from heaven. The ransom from heaven. Everyone praise his name. Come on. Jesus Messiah. Lord of all. His body, the bread, lift it up now. His body, the bread. His blood, the wine. Broken. Oh, praise his name. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Come on, church. Don't hold back. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Come on. Jesus Messiah. Sing it out. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. some praise this morning. Amen. He's worthy. Praise his name. Amen. Yes, Lord, receive it. Thank you. You may be seated.
And uh, right now we're going to have a special Oh the Blood, followed by a biblical message from our pastor, Ryan Thompson. Thank you, ladies. For those that might be newer to church, or maybe this is your first time walking into a, a church like this, you say, what are these songs? It sounds kind of weird. Songs about blood and, and, and Jesus' blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of, of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. In the Old Testament, the way that they would go to have their sins forgiven, they would take an animal, and that animal would be sacrificed and as the animal's blood was shed, the body was broken and the blood was shed, that would offer a temporary payment for their sin in God's sight, as you read the Old Testament. But you see, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ became that Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And as he, his, his body was broken and his, his blood was spilled on the cross of Calvary, it is that payment, the blood of Christ. And because his blood was that perfect sinless blood, he had committed no sin. Because of that perfect sinless blood, it is the payment that we, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, because of that payment, we can, uh, we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life with Christ in heaven forever. And so that's, and sometimes, I, I, I sometimes try, I've been saved for quite some time, but my, my, I did not grow up in church, I was not born into the church, I should say. I did not grow up in a second or third or fourth generation Christian home. And so I try sometimes to listen and to think, if somebody were coming to church for the first time and didn't know anything, that, that, that could maybe sound a little different. What are they talking about? But all that's talking about is the fact that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die. And Jesus died on the cross and his blood was spilled. And it's that payment, the, 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 the payment of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the spilled blood of Jesus Christ that is the atonement 
for your sins and for mine. And so, not a part of my message, but just a free commercial there for you after that song. Thank you for being in church today. Welcome to November. You have made it to the 11th month of 2020. 2020 has only has two more months left to do its thing, and all God's people said, all right, we're ready for 2021 probably. It's been a wild year for all of us, hasn't it? In many ways, our, our nation, our country has been temporarily changed in some crazy ways. Some things that none of us could have foreseen or expected when we began this year, and masks and distancing and the happiest place on earth being closed for seven, eight, nine months. Who would have expected that? Uh, the, uh, the shutdowns and all of the businesses and, and all of those effects. And even last night as I was driving home from the hospital um, and having spent some time with Leonard and Gina, and my heart broke to think of how many people have, have passed away, have died alone without loved ones by their sides. And, and just so many different ways that, that our nation, at least temporarily, has been, our country has been changed. Schools, of course, were closed for some time. Our dear Emperor Newsom telling us that we're not allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving like normal this year. And uh, he says that Thanksgiving has to be less than two hours with no singing. I don't know what kind of Thanksgiving parties he's been to. Number one, we never sing at ours. I don't know who's singing at Thanksgiving. And number two, who only celebrates for two hours? Like, that's not even long enough for a football game. And there are three football games on, th on, th on Thanksgiving. That's at least nine hours together, right? And uh, let alone, you've got to, you, it has to be long enough after you eat your Thanksgiving meal to get hungry to have some leftovers. That's when Thanksgiving really starts. And so, just some crazy stuff. And in light of, of Governor Newsom's dictatorial Thanksgiving decrees, I want to share with you the, the uh, Thompson family Thanksgiving announcement. I saw this. Here it is. I think we have that there. Thanksgiving is canceled this year due to COVID, but sadly our pet turkey has passed away and we are holding a visitation. In lieu of flowers, please, please bring a salad and a side dish. And so we're going to find a way to get together, I guess, for Thanksgiving. And I don't make, I, seriously, there are people in our church, I, I, I know of some, that, that their health needs dictate that they should not be with large groups. And I'm not making light of, of this season. I think if you've been here for any length of time, you know, you know my heart. But, uh, and, and there are some folks that they won't be able or should not, based on their health situation, get together with, with large groups. And I understand that. And all of us should be cautious and wise, but, uh, but, but I am looking forward to Thanksgiving with my family. And uh, we're going to enjoy some time together there. But our nation has temporarily changed in some ways. And, and I believe, actually, the mentality of our nation in some ways has probably been changed permanently. I said this early on, there are some things, you go back to 9-11, the mentality of our country has never been the same. Now, it doesn't mean it's, it's a bad nation, it doesn't mean we, we don't, but our, our mentality changed on 9-11. We understood for the first time in our lifetimes that attacks could come within our borders. It was the first time really since Pearl Harbor that that had happened. And it changed some things about our understanding of the world. And in my opinion, some things have changed, and that's not my message today, but there have been some mentality shifts even in government understanding what they can get away with and what they can do and the mentality of the American people giving away some of those things that we have never freedoms and rights and things that our mentality has changed in some of those ways. And, 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 and we see that in some ways, practically speaking, it's changed, but I believe spiritually speaking, there are some great ways that our country needs to change. Many are looking for the change that we desire in this Tuesday's elections. Many want to give President Trump another four years to continue enacting some of the change that he has in the previous four years. Others believe that the best thing that could happen would be for the change that they think that Biden and Harris would bring. But the reality is, no matter where you line up on the political spectrum, those that are watching or those in this room, the reality is that all of us see some things in our country that we believe need to be changed. And for all of us, those changes might be different. We might not agree on what changes should take place, but it's one reason why the voter turnout has been so strong this year, and, 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 and it's been, it feels like such a passionate election cycle. And every election cycle is passionate, and every election cycle we hear is the most important one for the future of our country. But it feels like this one is a little more passionate than times before. Why is that? There's a variety of reasons probably, but I believe one of those is because all of us see some things that we feel like we either want to see some of this change, or we want to keep some of that change, or whatever it might be, we see some ways that this could change our nation for what we think is better or worse, and, and so we want to have a part in that. The truth, church, and I know this sounds cliche, but I want us to really understand this, 
the truth is that the greatest change that we need in our country is spiritual. We need a national revival of turning to Jesus Christ and allowing his word to guide our lives and to change our nation. I didn't plan a message specifically for the election season. We found ourselves in Acts 16 in a series that we began over a year ago. And this is where God has us. And really, my message won't really hit on an election cycle. But with the title, I don't want you to think, oh, did he come up with it? This is where God had us in our, this is our 47th message in our verse-by-verse walkthrough of Acts that started last June. This is where God has us. The title of the message this morning is How to Change a Country. How to Change a Country. If you will, turn with me to uh, Acts chapter number 16. The fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, and then Acts. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to grab one from the pew rack in front of you. If you're sitting in one of the chairs back there and you don't have a copy of God's Word, we should probably remember that. I just thought of it. We've been meeting for like three months. Pastor Doug or someone, we should remember to get some extra um, pew Bibles there for some of those chairs for folks that are sitting in the back. The reason being, I say it almost every week, but if there's any power in anything that I preach today, it's going to come from the Word of God. And if that's where the power is, I think you should see it for yourself. And maybe if you're like me and if you have your own Bible and the habit of underlining or taking notes and and, uh, seeing some things from Scripture. If you're following along on the tablet, uh, I'll be reading, and we'll, if we read together a verse, we'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Acts in chapter number 16. Last week, I brought a message entitled, The Gospel Arrives to Europe. And if we can throw that map up there, we looked at Acts 16 to give us all a little background. Acts 16 is the story of Paul's second missionary journey. He started right here above that, that where it says Syria, and that little dot that says Antioch. Paul, Silas, and, and Paul and Silas start there over in Lystra, so you can follow the kind of the fourth dot along the line. In Lystra, they pick up Timothy, a young, young Timothy, who would become a, prodig- a protege, I guess you, you, you could say, of Paul in the ministry. And so they're on their second missionary journey, and they continued on, and they wanted to go north, they wanted to go south, and God said, no, I want you to go to Europe. And so it says Troas, they, they boarded a ship, they went over to the island there, and then went on into Neapolis, and the second dot Philippi, about 10 miles inland, is where they landed. That's really the first place, they, that is the first place they, that's recorded that they landed to preach, begin preaching the gospel of Christ in Europe. This is the first time that Europe gets the gospel. That was last week's message, and we, we studied the entire chapter, chapter 16. We looked at 35 verses together. We won't be doing that today. I told you last week, that was all foundation for the next three or four uh, uh, weeks of messages we're going to be pulling out of Acts 16. What is happening in this chapter is the seeds of gospel change are being planted in a city, Philippi, a country, Greece, and a continent, Europe, that would have far-reaching effects for millennia. You see, if you came to know Christ in the Western Hemisphere, if you were introduced to the gospel in the Western Hemisphere somewhere in, in the 1900s or 2000s, you can look back and trace the roots of where that came from, from Acts 16. Paul and Silas taking the gospel to Europe were the, the, so not only did it change a city, Philippi, and not only did it change a country, Greece, and not at that time, and not only did it change a continent, Europe, it had far-reaching impacts into many other countries, cities, countries, and even continents. And so today our message is how to change a country. It could have been entitled how to change a city or even how to change a continent. But we're going to look here, and in this chapter, Paul and Silas, they sailed to Europe. You remember the story last week? And there was no synagogue. That's where Paul Paul would normally go to start preaching, people that already knew something of Old Testament Scripture, the Jewish Jewish people. There was no synagogue uh, because there weren't at least ten men that would, would start a synagogue. So there were just a few women that went down to the riverside to begin praying. So Paul went down, very humble beginnings for, for, for country change, for national change. He goes down to preach to a few ladies by a river. And a lady named Lydia of Thyatira got saved, a seller of purple, a wealthy woman. In that culture, women were not viewed on the same level with respect to men. In fact, the Jews would often pray. Uh, they would pray, God, thank you that you didn't make me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That's how they viewed in their society. And what does God show us when he goes to Europe? The first person that he gives the precious good news of the gospel to is a woman. 
a lady. God's gospel is for everybody, no matter gender, nationality, upbringing, your economic status, no matter any of that, God loves you and he wants you to know the truth of the gospel. And, and so we see that Lydia got saved and then Paul, he cast out the demon from that demon-possessed young damsel and they didn't like it because that affected the business of her masters. So they start lying about him and they throw him and Silas into jail. Remember that last week? They're in jail. What did they do at midnight? They prayed and sang. What a beautiful testimony. We'll, we'll bring a message out on that probably next Sunday. They prayed and sang and the earthquake, the, 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 God sent an earthquake and opened the prison doors. The, the, uh, the jailer there, uh, Philippian jailer, gets saved in his house. And we see a church in Philippi planted. We see the gospel doing amazing things. Later, Paul will write the, the book of Philippians is a letter back to that church. And we will see that this visit began to change a city and would have reaching effects into a country and even a continent. And so we're going to, we, we see here lives changed and, and, and even cities turned upside down with the gospel. And so today we're going to look at how to change a country. To answer that question, we're going to need to answer the questions of how, who, and where that are all answered in this passage. So how do we change a country? I want you to see in verse 13, would you read Acts 16, verse 13, aloud with me together. Acts 16, verse 13. Ready? Begin. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. What did they speak? They, what did they, we know they were speaking the gospel because verse 14 in the second half of it says, Whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Where do you see life change begin? Where do you see change in a church begin? Where do you see change in a city and a country? How do you change a country? How do you change, by the way, you change a country by changing a whole bunch of lives. Countries are made of people. How do you change a life? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You heard them sing about it here. Oh, it saved my life. The blood of Jesus saved my life. It completely changed me. We are not just, the Bible says, we don't just clean ourselves up. The Bible says we are new creatures. The Bible says we are transformed. We're, we're not just, we were kind of bad and now we're a little better. We were dead and now we're alive. How do you change a country? How do you answer that? The, the, the first question we have to, have to answer is how? And the first answer to that question is you preach the gospel. May I just say, on this and again this is not a, a political message this message wasn't planned with the election in mind but what America needs more than anything else whether you're passionate about your party your candidate your 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 local affiliate the congressman I I had uh, I had breakfast a couple weeks ago with one of our senators and with the Newport Beach City Council member and I'm, I'm all for those that serve in those capacities but what is going to bring true change to any person to any family to any church to any area is the gospel of Jesus Christ now vote. My wife and I voted on Friday. I'm not saying don't vote. What I am saying is don't place your faith and your trust in those you vote for. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. It is God that, that raises up kings and brings them down. God is the one in control of all of this. And if your candidate gets in, praise God and, and, and rejoice. And if your candidate doesn't get in, praise God and rejoice. Our calling next Sunday is no different than it is today as Christians, as, as the church of Jesus Christ. We have to preach the gospel. We need to speak of Christ to friends, to co-workers, invite them to church with you, share things on social media. Our churches need to be faithful in preaching the true answer. Lydia was saved, lives were changed. Her household was saved, probably including servants and baptized. The demon-possessed woman was delivered from an evil spirit. The jailer and his family got saved. How did change come to that area? Change came, change came by somebody lifting up Christ. That's where change came from. Orange County doesn't need another church sharing human wisdom, proclaiming my traditions or my opinions or my political leanings or my preferences. Orange County and the people of this church and every other Bible-believing church need a return to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the way, not just the church and the pastor. Those in your life need you to speak Jesus to them. 
They need you to share the truth. Those that you come across, those that you work with, those that you live near, those at the store, those that make your coffee, they need some Christians that are willing to engage them where they're at. Paul went to them down by the riverside and speak the good news. You find somebody that's hurting, that's struggling, that's frustrated, that's discouraged, that's depressed. Share Jesus with them. Tell them about how he changed your life. Tell them about what he's done for you. They need you to share how he changed your life. How do you change a country? Number one, preach the gospel. Number two, how do you change a country? You pray. What does it say in verse 25? And again, normally we would go verse by verse. We did all of that last week, so I'm pulling some truths from the passage we systematically went through last week. Look at verse number 25, the first half of it. Acts 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, what church? When all hope seemed lost, they had followed God. God, we want to preach over here. We want to preach over there. God said, no, I want you to go to Europe. God, we're in Europe. We're going to go to Philippi. Okay, great. We preached. That lady got saved. That's pretty exciting. If they had social media, hey, it's, this new ministry in Philippi is going great. This, this wealthy lady just got saved. This is going to be awesome. Can't wait to see what else God's going to do here in Philippi. You know, you know what else God was going to do? He was going to allow them to get scourged, to get beaten, to get bloody, to get hurt, and to get imprisoned. That's what God was going to allow them to do. That, that doesn't make for the best social media post. And you know what their response was when the plans didn't go the way they thought? They prayed. They didn't, they didn't shake their fist at God. They didn't get angry. They didn't get bitter. They didn't seek revenge. They didn't, they didn't start a, 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 an, an underground movement to try to overthrow those that had been wrong with them. What, they prayed. When all hope seemed lost, what did they do? They prayed. You want to see something change, a, a life, a family, a church, a, a city, a, a state, a country. What should we do? To, we should pray. What was God's message to his children in Israel when their nation was in trouble in Chronicles? What was his message? You know that verse? If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and, and what? Pray. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. National change, God said to the nation of Israel, begins with national prayer. National change begins with believers praying to the God of heaven, would you intercede on behalf of our nation and of our children and of our grandchildren? Pray if my people, we post, we pontificate, we debate, we criticize, we boycott, we picket. Do we pray? How much did you pray for our nation this week? How much did I? I just want to see some change. How's your prayer? The Bible says to pray for those that are in authority. Well, I didn't vote for them. Pray for those that are in authority. Well, I did vote for them. Pray for those that are in authority. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. Oh, we love to say, I hope D.C. solves all the problems for us. And I'm thankful for those that serve in D.C. with a righteous heart and, and seek to do what's right for our nation. But, but the answer is for you and for me to pray. Pray for our country. Pray for those in leadership. Yes, get involved and do those things. Yes, vote. But pray. Will you pray for our president in January 2020, whether he's the man you voted for or not? Have you prayed for your neighbors? For your co-workers, for your family, for your church, for your city, for your friends, for your enemies. You know, that's, that's what a Christian's supposed to do. What did they do? Didn't look like great change was coming to the city of Philippi. Looked like the only guys that could bring the change through their preaching were locked up in jail. And you know what they did? They prayed. How do you change a country? How do we change a country? Talk to me, number one. What do we need to do? We need to preach the... Number two, we need to. Number three, how do you change a country? You praise. Praise. Look at verse 25, the second half of it. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and then notice what it says in verse 25. And what, church? And saying what? Praises unto God. Do you see that little phrase? And the prisoners heard them. People hear your response to the dark times. They see your response to the deep valleys of your life. And it impacts them. There's something powerful, life-changing when we watch a Christian keep their praise when they have no human reason to praise. I think of Gina, and she's walked through two and a half years of deep valley with her husband's health. The last year, has, he's been in a hospital. She, for, for six, seven months, she hasn't been able to spend time with him personally. And you know where she is every Sunday? Right there. 
You know what she's doing every Sunday? Singing praises. You know where she is on Monday? In her fifth grade class, investing in those children. Her life is a life of praise. God, I don't understand, but you're still good. You know what you'll see on her every time you talk to her? A smile, a rejoicing. You know what that is? That's powerful. A Christian praising in the midst of heartache is powerful. There is something deeply impactful about seeing a Christian praise in the midst of their darkness. I want to say that statement again. There is something deeply impactful about seeing a Christian praise in the midst of their darkness. What was the answer when things weren't going the way that they wanted? When, when the politicians were against Christianity in Philippi, when they were imprisoning them for stand, what was their response? We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to pray to God. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to sing praises. And that little concert in that jail didn't just stay to them. And the prisoners heard them. The jailer heard them. People took notice and said there's something different about them. Guess what? When a trial in a few verses is going to come to his to their jailer, when, when, when a life-shattering trial is about to come into his life that he didn't expect, who did he run to in his time of need? He ran to the Christians that praised in their time of need. He ran to them and said, what must I do to be saved? I watched you praise in your midnight hour, and now I'm in my midnight hour. I need to know the answer that you have because I have no praise. Christian, have you lost your praise? Have you lost your joy? When we sing together corporately, do you just stand there and kind of mumble the words and and not move your lips Uh, on your own in the car or with your family? Have you lost that? Has COVID stolen your joy? Has the news media taken your praise and replaced it with fear? Do the elections have you anxious and worried? Have you stopped singing praise? Take a lesson from Paul and Silas and praise him even here, wherever the even here is for you. How do you change a country? You preach the gospel, you pray, you praise. This week I heard a song I'd never heard before. I shared it on my Facebook feed. It was a friend of mine singing. She and I went to the same college. She has one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. She and her husband live in Tennessee. She and her husband have faced some deep pain and heartache in their lives. They they face some really difficult things, but she's not lost her praise. And I don't normally do this in my message, but I had planned I had planned it even before yesterday, and then as I drove to Harbor City to see Gene, Gina, and Leonard, as I listened to this song, tears filled my eyes, and I thought, this is what we all need. The song is entitled, Hallelujah, Even Here. She she recorded it in her car on her cell phone. The audio isn't great, but it reminded me when I heard it earlier this week of this, this passage, because it says on the bridge, I want you to listen to the words in a moment and think about it. On the bridge, it says, sometimes choosing just to sing is the thing that changes everything. And I thought of Paul and Silas. When they prayed and sang, what happened? God changed everything. So I'd like you for a couple of moments, as I think about Paul and Silas singing praise, and think about you, this song, Hallelujah, even here. Too hard, it comes so easy. I find 
peace here in surrendering and letting go. Hallelujah. When the storm is relentless, hallelujah. When the battle Nothing left to give mm, becomes the sweetest offering, and sometimes choosing just to sing is the thing that changes everything. Hallelujah! When the storm is relentless, hallelujah! When the song before this week. I've probably listened to it 25 times, probably five or eight times on the way to and from the hospital last night. Hallelujah, even here. What were Paul and Silas saying? Hallelujah, even here in the prison cell. Can you say that? This Tuesday, will you be able to say hallelujah, even here? Those that are watching you at work, at home, your kids, your social media feed, will they know that you're saying Hallelujah, even here. Whatever's coming into your life, hallelujah, even here. How did they change a country? They lifted up Christ everywhere that they went. They preached, they prayed, they praised. By the way, this passage doesn't stop here with how to change a country. It shows us who does God want to use to change a country and who does he want to reach. I want to answer that next question. And these last two questions I'll answer quickly. The who, that was the bulk of the message. The who is does God use to change a country and who does he want to reach? The first who that I see in this passage was the rich. That Lydia, uh, the seller of purple, sometimes we, w- wherever we are, whatever our group is, we kind of look at the other group with disdain. If you're, if you're maybe poor, you look at the wealthy with disdain. If you're wealthy, you maybe look at the poor. I'm not saying everyone does this, but we can have a tendency or, well, let's tax the rich more and make them pay for my stuff and let's do this. And even in politics, that's kind of the mentality. Let's pit classes against each other. The gospel of Jesus Christ, do you know who God wants to use to change a country? He wants to use the rich. He t- took the, the, the word of God to Lydia. You know who else he wants to use? He wants to use the poor. The demon-possessed damsel. She was a slave to these men. And you know what? The, the, Paul and Silas, the word of Christ, the name of Christ changed her life. It, it got rid of that demonic spirit in her. You know who God wants to change? The working class. The jailer, the Philippian jailer, you know who God wants to use to change a country? Women, the first convert. Men, uh, the, the jailer and others. Families, we have two households reached in this one chapter. Those seeking God, the ladies by the river. Those against God, the men, the criminals in the, in the, uh, in the jail. Those aren't really what you think of as your deacons and your preachers. And you know what? God wanted the men who were against God to hear the gospel. Different races. In this one chapter, we have Asians and Greeks and and Romans and Jews and maybe a few others that we don't know what their nationality is how do you change a country who does God want us to reach he wants us to reach everybody he cares about the rich and the poor and the middle class he cares about women and men he cares about this nationality and that in fact in his sight it's all one race the human race we sometimes close ourselves in in our little bubbles spending all of our time with those who look like us think like us, act like us, and believe like us. It's one reason I love our church. You look around this church, and we have all kinds, we have people that have doctorate degrees, and we have people that are high school dropouts, and God loves and is using both of of those groups mightily. 
and we have people that were born in the early uh, to mid 1900s and we have people that were born in the last year in our church and we have folks that were have been multi-generation in America and folks that just got to America somewhere in their in this generation and we have all kinds of things that's what it should be church we will never see God use us to change the world around us from our safe homogenized bubbles God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That person over there, now I understand we, we must stand for truth, and sometimes the truth will divide us. I'm not talking about compromising our beliefs and our doctrines to just accept any evil, ungodly, wicked religious stance or political stance. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, and yes, stand for truth, but make sure your heart is right as you stand for truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. God died for the Republican, the Democrat, the Independent. God died for the educated and the uneducated. God died for the rich and the poor, the American soldier and the terrorist, the Baptist, the atheist, the Catholic, the animist, and the agnostic. Red and yellow, black, brown, white, they are all precious in his sight. We see that here in his, how did they change a country? The gospel was not for some select group of people. The gospel was for everyone he came into contact with. The gospel is for anybody that would listen. If we are going to change our world, we're going to have to grow in our love for our Lord and for those he died for. Lastly, this passage answers the question of where. Where should we preach? Where should we pray? Where should we praise? We said how. How do you change a country? Three thoughts. Preach, pray, and praise. That's how you change a country. Who? Who does God want us to use to change? To, who does God want us to reach? Everybody. And then three, where? Where does God want us to preach, to pray, to praise? I see first in the church, and this might be taking a little liberty. I'm talking about that little gathering where they were praying by the river. It's not what we would call a New Testament local church, but it was definitely a spiritual gathering. And you know what Paul did in a spiritual gathering? He preached and I believe prayed and praised. He preached the gospel. God won. And we are usually pretty good at doing these three things here preaching, praying, and praising, even if you don't want to, if you just sat here for the last hour, you were kind of forced to preach. Now, you weren't forced to praise, but you had to, you had to endure while a bunch of people around you praised. And you're hearing preaching, and we're pretty good at here, but we see that that happened, if I can, in the church, in that religious gathering. Let her be in our daily lives. Notice what it says in verse 18. And this did she many days. This demon-possessed woman was following them in their daily lives. And what did Paul do? It wasn't time for a worship service, but in his regular routine, Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Paul, this thing of, of sharing Christ, this thing of being a Christian was not a one-hour commitment for Paul. It's why he changed. God used him to change so many cities and start so many churches and see so many lives change with the power of the gospel. This thing of the Christian life for Paul, he, he said, he said uh, that his life was Christ. Christ who is our life. That's what he said in one of his letters. It was not a one-hour commitment. Or you say, well, I, I come back, Pastor Ryan, on Sunday night at 5, and I'm excited about our message tonight at 5, looking at the life of King Saul. I come back at 5. It was not just a two- or three-hour commitment on a Sunday. For Paul, where did he preach, and where did he pray, and where did he praise? In his daily life, everywhere he went, he was seeking to be a Christian that shines the light of Jesus everywhere he went. Don't compartmentalize Christ into your family a few hours a week, and then you do your thing the rest of the week. No. Christ is a part of everything we do. Where, where should we do these things in our deepest valleys? I've already talked about that. Verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. And then lastly, where should we do it? In our miraculous victories. Look at verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. But cr Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, listen to this, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. That's amazing. Who was the one that locked Paul up in stocks to make sure he couldn't get out of jail? That guy. We don't know for sure, but it would not be, it would not be unlikely that that man had a part in scourging Paul, in beating him. And God has now answered. Now Paul is enjoying a miraculous victory in his life. He's on a mountaintop experience. 
things are going good. And you know what Paul's heart was when things were going good? I still want to do whatever I can to help those around me. Here's the thing. In our human condition, when things are going well, it's easy to get distracted and just enjoy it for ourselves. Take, eat, drink, and be merry. Man, God, you've really blessed me. It's one reason in the Old Testament, uh, in Deuteronomy, Moses had to challenge and command the children of Israel. He said, you're getting ready to go into a season of miraculous victory. You're going into Canaan. You're getting ready to experience some mountaintop experiences. And here's what he said. I think it's Deuteronomy 6, if you want to look back at it. It says, not right now, but later. It says, beware lest thou forget. Be careful because sometimes success, success causes us to forget how much we need God. Victories cause us to think, man, I've got this on my own. When the bills are paid and when the, when the, when the kids are doing well and the, when the health is good, we, we think, I can, I can handle this. And, and it's been said we would run to him less if we walked with him more. But often the times that we run to God are times of crisis. And at 9-11, our churches were filled with people praying. And, and even during earlier, during the COVID, and, and people looking for an answer. And when things are bad, when you lose the job and when there's a health need. And, and I'm not saying don't run to God in those times. What I am saying is in the times of plenty and in the times of blessing, don't forget God still wants you to be a witness and a light. God still wants to use you to impact other people's lives. We sit back and enjoy our comfort and our ease, not Paul and Silas. What could they have done if they wanted, church? Let's just think about it logically. They're in jail. They're, they're bleeding. They've got some small, maybe some things are starting to scab up a little bit. There's still some ooze, some pus. They've, they've got these terrible sores. They're in pain. They've, God just broke off the chains and opened all the prison doors. What could they have done very easily? They could have gotten out of there, saved themselves. And you know what Paul did in the midst of his miraculous victory? Don't hurt yourself. I know you hurt me. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here. God loves you. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. In the midst of their miraculous victories. The bad times with Paul and Silas, I want you to hear this, this, this statement. The bad times didn't discourage them away from preaching, praying, and praising. And the good times didn't distract them away from preaching, praying, and praising. The bad times have a way of discouraging us from preaching, praying, and praising. The good times have a way of distracting us from preaching, praying, and praising. And with Paul and Silas, it didn't matter what the times were. They were preaching, praying, and praising. You've listened well. What does America need, church family? America needs a host of preaching, praying, and praising Christians. America needs churches who will preach and pray and praise to the rich, the poor, the friends of God, and the enemies of God in times of prosperity and in times of physical or spiritual famine. America needs preachers who believe that God can still work even when faced with the possibility of a prison experience. Your family needs to see a believer who preaches, prays, and praises when people joyfully receive you and when people despitefully use you. Think about it. The ladies by the river, what did they do? They joyfully received Paul and Silas. That, that demon-possessed damsel's masters, what did they do? They despitefully lied and accused Paul and Silas. And what did it do? It didn't change Paul and Silas one bit. What effect did those things have on them? Absolutely nothing. They kept preaching and praying and praising. How? How are we going to see real change come? The gospel of Christ. Prayer. Who does God want to have that change happen in their lives? Everybody. And where should we as Christians be doing those things? At church? In our daily lives? In the, in the midnight hour? On the mountaintop experience? God wants us to do those. And so my question, church family, is how's your preaching? Who have you shared Christ with recently? And our nation needs change! Who did you invite to join you in church? to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Who did you say a prayer for? Who did you send a text message with a Bible verse? Man, we, we've got to get this guy into office. We've got to get that guy out of office. We've got to get that proposition voted down. And again, I voted on Friday. I'm with you. But as Christians, how's your preaching? How is it? How's your sharing of the good news with those around you? Hey, Christian, how's your praying? Are you praying or just worrying and complaining? 
And Christian, how's your praising? Can you say hallelujah even here? When the battle is, when the storm is relentless, as that chorus said, when the battle seems endless, hallelujah even here. We need, I think all of us would agree, our country needs change. My life needs some change. That's why people get so passionate. We, we, we think if we get that guy in, maybe the change we're looking for will come. And depending on what guy you get in, certain change does come. President Trump has nominated three Supreme Court justices. That brings some change to our nation. Wherever you land, whether you think that's good or bad, the reality is that brings some change. So I get it, but sometimes we put our hope in that's going to bring the change we need. And you know what we see with Paul and Silas? How did they bring change to a continent that would bring the gospel to us? Wherever they found themselves, they faithfully preached, prayed, and prayed. Let's help bring the change that's needed in our world this week. Let's preach Christ. Let's pray to God. And let's praise Him, even here. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. God, I pray these truths from Acts 16 would be a help and, and applicable to your people. I pray, dear God, that you would help all of us to see that, Lord, in the midst of a friendly political climate, Paul and Silas preach, and in the midst of a, an a oppressive political climate, Paul and Silas preach. It didn't matter. Their calling as your messengers didn't change with the winds of time, with the circumstances. And God, help us to realize that while, yes, we're called to pray and be involved and be salt and light and vote and get involved in that process, God, help us understand that our calling as Christians does not change. That our hope is not found, Lord, in, 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 in Sacramento. Our hope is not found at City Hall. Our hope is not found in Washington, D.C. The hope for any lasting eternal change will only come through Jesus Christ. May we be passionate, as passionate as we get about sports and as we get about our hobbies and our careers and, and our candidates. God, would our passion far surpass and exceed any of those passions for the good news of Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, in a moment I'm going to ask all of us to stand and the piano will begin to play. This is an opportunity for you to respond to what you've, you've heard. And maybe I said, what do we do? How do we change a nation? We pray. Maybe some of you want to come and kneel. What, is there anything magical, Pastor Ryan, about kneeling? No, there's nothing magical about it, but it does in the scriptures to kneel the posture of your body. And some people physically can't kneel. I understand that. But the posture of your body does indicate a heart posture at times in Scripture. And to kneel is an outward expression of an internally bowed heart. And maybe there are some that want to come and kneel for our nation for Tuesday's elections. Want to kneel and pray for Orange County. Want to kneel and pray for our states and for those that are suffering right now. And, and, and spend some time in prayer. Maybe you've lost your praise and, and you want to come today and say, Hallelujah, even here in the midst of my, my suffering, God, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to praise you. If there's somebody here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're to die, you don't know for sure that you'd go to heaven, I'd encourage you to just slide out of your seat and see one of our pastors here at the front. We'd love to take God's word and show you how God can, as we talked about what can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today, that precious blood of Christ can take away every one of your sins. If you'd, if you'd like to know more about that, talk to one of our pastors if there's a special prayer need. God, I pray now in these closing moments that you would seal some things in our hearts and God change us. Help us to understand that we are a part of the change that needs to happen as Christians. Your heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let's all stand together. The, the piano, Janine and Hadley begin to play. The altar is open. If you'd like to pray by yourself or pray with somebody, we invite you to come and kneel here at the altar. Pray for your church. Pray for the young family. Pray for our nation. Pray that in our midnight hour, we would be a people that would sing and praise. Pray and praise. Pray for your family. The change we need can only come from Christ.
Lord, I do pray for each one of us that, God, we would have a double portion of that spirit that Paul and Silas had that preached, sang, prayed in their prison experience. God, I do pray for those in authority. I pray for our president and vice president. I pray for our Congress and Senate. Lord, I pray for our governor and those that serve us in this state. And I pray that those that do not know you as Savior, that God, there would be somebody around them that would share Christ with them and they would come to know you as Savior. I pray that we as believers, God, as undoubtedly there will be some ungodly responses to the results of this week's election. I pray that we as believers would shine as light in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. Help us this week to share the love of Christ with those around us. Help us to remember that, God, in our family, you and our commitment to you will have way more impact in our family's lives than any bill or prop. And help us to be the Christians you want us to be, first in our own homes and then in our church house. And God, would you use this church to bring eternal change to the lives that it touches, I pray in Jesus' name. We'll let all of you be seated right there. And is everybody seated? I'll have it one at a time. I'll have these folks here stand. You can have a seat there, Rob and Jenny. And uh, we had a, uh, a half-off sale on membership this week, it looks like, and a whole bunch of folks took us up on it. And we got a bunch of people uniting with our church. Each one of these has been coming for some time, and we've individual, for those that are new and wondering, what does that mean? To We just went through a four-week class where we explained a lot of what our church stands for and who we are and history and things of that nature. But you saw um, today... Uh, Norma got baptized, and the Bible talks about in Acts chapter 2, those that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added to the church. And so baptism is one way that people unite with, obviously they're identifying with Christ, but they also unite then with our church and, and become a part of the church membership here. For others that have been biblically saved and baptized, and God, all, all of these folks you began attending regularly throughout this COVID season, and that each one of them individually has reached out and said, I believe that God is leading us to join with the membership of Liberty Baptist Church. And when somebody reaches out to us, then we, we have a conversation, generally in person, if there's some reason it can't, sometimes it's on the phone, but uh, we'll meet individually with, with each person and, and talk to them, have they been biblically saved? They know for sure if they died, they'd go to heaven, and then biblically baptized after salvation. And if they, if they have been by a church that would believe in the, in the core doctrines that we believe, then we welcome them by what we call a statement of faith. They are stating that yes, I, I, Christ is my Savior, and I've identified with Him in believer's baptism, and so we welcome them into the church family that way. So this isn't just something that somebody just decided to walk down today. This is something where we've met and heard the testimonies, as many of you have united with our church in recent weeks. And we'll start here. Ralph and Norma, you can stand right here and face the church, if you will. And uh, they began, I told you, they began coming just a few weeks ago. Ralph uh, has been saved for quite some time. How long have you known Christ, Ralph? Put them on the spot there. 48 years. Yeah, that's all. I had to do that math real fast and to know the Lord. And, and Norma um, came to Christ recently. And Norma, of course, got baptized. And Ralph, they want to make Liberty their church home. We've met with them. Would you welcome them into our church family? Thank you. I'm honored to be a pastor. Thank you so much. So you should be seated there. And then over here, Sylvia I had the privilege. Do you mind standing? I'll stand by you. It's kind of nervous standing in front of all these folks, isn't it? Sylvia, I had the privilege to meet with Sylvia today. And Sylvia had been in our auditorium a few times before singing with a, uh, a choir, Dr. Melton, your choir that you lead. And, and uh, she's been saved. We talked. She's actually a pastor's daughter. Grew up in a pastor's home and has uh, been faithful to our Lord for many, many years. And uh, through friends and relationships started coming during the shutdown as we were one of the only churches open. And said, when I came, I found some things I... I haven't, I haven't had in a church in quite some time, I think that's fair to say. And so they said, I want to unite with liberty. And so a sweet spirit, a great love for the Lord from a child has known the Lord. And, and we had a great time meeting with her this week. And welcome Sylvia into our church family here. God bless you, Sylvia. Lou, Lou's got his Michigan State. You want to show the, the crowd there your shirt there? They beat Michigan in football yesterday, so he's pretty happy about that. Lou even put a suit coat on today, Lou. Yeah, normally he's got his Hawaii. Look at that. It's got his name right there. Fancy guy. Lou moved here. Where'd you move here? Was it Michigan? Michigan. Michigan moved here during the COVID shutdown. Moved here. July. July moved here. And, uh, and again, through some relationships and friends that were coming to our church, Lou came. And Lou is transferring from Highland, I think I read it, Highland Park Baptist in Michigan there, South, Southfield, Michigan. And uh, Lou knows the Lord. He came through our starting point class and and has been faithful Sunday morning, often on Sunday night, Wednesday night, coming to services, and wants to unite with liberty. Would you welcome Lou to our church family? Thank you, Lou. Last but not least, 
And if you mind, this is Rob and Jenny. Many of you that are involved in our school ministry know Rob and Jenny. Your kids have been coming to our school for how many years? So five, five or six school years since he was in TK, and wonderful Christian folks, and, and uh, they have been faithful in a, in a church in Orange County, and through different things, God began to direct them. They've had their kids in our school and have seen the, the impact of that in their lives. Rob actually has helped on a volunteer basis with a bunch of our IT stuff with, with Caleb Powers, and, and I think just gradually started plugging into our ministry here and, and uh, reached out about a month or two ago. And, and we've met with them. They know the Lord. And we're excited. This is a wonderful family. Their children are in our uh, school. And now their entire family is a part of our church family. We're excited to welcome Rob and Jenny Goss, the Goss family. And, and give them a welcome to our church family. Let you be seated there. And in just a moment, um, Doug, we'll have you take those that are, and if you're not comfortable, it's no problem. I don't do anything you're not comfortable with. But for those that are comfortable, we'll maybe have you go kind of out toward the, the open. We got the new uh, roll-up doors. They look good, don't they? And uh, maybe toward those roll-up doors. And I'd like for some folks to uh, greet and get to know. Again, for those that say, I have a hard time with names, if you have to ask them, it's okay. But Rob and Jenny, that's the Goss family. Then Lou, Sylvia, and then Ralph and Norma. And they'll join in our church family here. At this time, we have just a couple quick announcements on the video. with us today. Before we dismiss, let's take a look at what is coming up on the horizon. This year, Soldiers of the Cross men's meeting will be held at Lighthouse Baptist Church of Laverne on Saturday, November 7th. This is always a fantastic time as our men from all around California come together to hear the gospel preaching from men like Doug Fisher, Kurt Skelly, Corey Mears, and others. The cost of this meeting is $10 per person. To register for this year's men's meeting, please go to www.soldiersofthecross.com slash registration. Join us on November 8th for a special Veterans Day service. We will be honoring those who have served our country by serving in our armed forces. If you have served in any branch of the military, please come dressed in your uniform. We look forward to a special time of recognition and gratitude during our Sunday morning service. Our annual parent baby dedication is going to be held on December 20th during our morning worship service. If you would like to participate in this special service, please contact the church office by calling 949-760-5444 or by emailing olga at libertybaptistchurch.org. Thanks again for joining us today. If this is your first time at Liberty, don't forget to pick up your free gift by seeing one of our greeters on your way out. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you tonight back at 5 for our evening service. All right, let's all stand together. That Veterans Day service is next Sunday, so if you, if, you have, uh, if, you, if you have served and you have a uniform you can wear, we invite you to wear that next Sunday as we'll honor those that have served our armed forces. Tonight will be week two in our series on toxic leadership, studying the life of King Saul. After the evening service, we'll be able to enjoy that beautiful courtyard. The teenagers are going to have a tri-tip slider fundraiser. They're going to have tri-tip sliders, chips, and other things. I think it's $10 per plate to help raise some funds um, for the youth center and the youth group that they have there. And so enjoy us for some um, food and fellowship. And then Wednesday night, we'll be in week number two of our family talk series covering the different ages and stages of life and some biblical principles for how to walk through those parts of life. At this time, oh, I wanted to mention... Uh, ushers, I, I, I'm sorry, if I can chat, can we get some offering plates while Kevin's praying and have folks at the door? Anything that you give in those offering plates is going to go directly to the young family. They've had a ton of medical expenses in the last two years. Obviously now there's some more expenses with um, those and, and, and Gina has been the only, she's a teacher in our school um, and, and has been the only source of, of income there. Anything you'd like to give or if you're not prepared to give right now, if you want to give online and just put uh, Gina Young or Young Family anything there will go. If you have your regular offering, um, you can put that in the offering boxes, or if it's in an envelope, dictate which part of that would be for the young family. And so we don't want to get that mixed up, like if you're giving toward missions, and we've made that commitment to missions, but so there's the offering boxes that are by the doors there, or you can give online, but any ushers on your way out, if you'd like to give a, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever comes in, I think would just be a help for some of the expenses that they're going to have in the coming weeks as as they take care of some of those details. Kevin, dismiss us in prayer if you would. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, again, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I thank you for the message we heard this morning. Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, 
Lord, we remember those things that we heard. Lord, our, our nation, Lord, needs you uh, more than anything. Uh, Lord, we recognize, we understand that we can do nothing without you. So, Lord, help us to acknowledge that. And then, Lord, help us to live that out as we go out today, or tomorrow, this week, and we're running into our coworkers, loved ones, family, and friends. Lord, help us to preach Jesus to them uh, through our lives, our words, and our actions. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good evening. It's glad you're here tonight. Let's all stand together. Let's sing that song. How can we? I keep from singing. singing we welcome you to church tonight the bible says in isaiah chapter number six in the year that king uzziah died i saw also the lord sitting upon a throne 
high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and with twain or two he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Verse 3 says, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 5 says, Then said I, Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We do serve, as it's been said, a thrice holy God. And you know, the more we get to see God in His holiness, His righteousness, the less we begin to think of ourselves. Isaiah said, When I saw the King, what did he say? He said, he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. As we get a real picture of who God is, it reminds us of who we really are. And anything that we might boast in, any, any goodness of our lives that we might try to lift up in light of the holiness of God, really, as the Bible says, is just filthy rags. Thank God for the holiness of our Lord. What a great morning we enjoyed together here at, at the Liberty Baptist Church. And thank you for coming back this Sunday evening as we're continuing through our series Uh, on on the life of King Saul, and I enjoyed our study in the book of Acts this morning. And how do you change a country? Preach the gospel, pray, and praise. We saw from Acts 16 in the lives of Paul and Silas as God brought them to that new continent there in in Philippi, in Greece, in Europe. And uh, I enjoyed uh, growing together with you. I trust the Lord gave you some things that will change the way we walk and talk and live and think and pray this week. And help us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers also. I I mentioned to our church family um, that our our dear brother Leonard Young went to heaven this morning about 7.45 a.m. And to Gina and Leonard, I was asking Gina last night at the hospital, I said, now how many years has it been? I knew it had been a couple decades. She said, I think 22 or 23, something like that, when they came to Liberty. She was expecting Andy, who is now uh, earning his master's degree in college, when they moved over here to Liberty. And they've been faithful folks in our church. While I was in the hospital, we FaceTimed a few different people. And and I had the privilege to FaceTime Pastor Tomlinson, who was their pastor for, uh, I guess, about 17 of, or 18 of those years. And, uh, and pray, we had different folks praying over the phone and talking with them. And a sweet time. The Bible says we sorrow not as others sorrow, as those which have no hope. The reality is we do still sorrow. If you love somebody, of course, it's a grief and it's a sorrow when God chooses to take them home. But there is uh, there's a hope, and beyond a hope, there's a reality and a promise that we will see him again. And as the Lord leads, and in the coming days and weeks, and we'll let you know details, we'll put it out on the church social media, um, details of, of service and what we're going to do there. But as the Lord allows, we seek to be a, a blessing and minister to that family during their time of difficulty and, and uh, do what you can to be a help and an encouragement to them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you for the promise of heaven. I thank you that one day soon we will all be stepping on that shore. I pray while you give us health and strength down here that, God, we would redeem the time. Lord, may we not live selfishly and, and just for our own gain and our own glory, but, God, truly, would you help us to see the brevity of life and the importance of living for your glory and for, God, your kingdom. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God and all your righteousness and understanding Then there's the promise of blessings that come after that. I pray that each one of us, Lord, through this and through the service tonight, we'd be helped and challenged uh, to become more like you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated there. If we miss any of the kiddos with, uh, with a uh, bulletin uh, or, or a uh, kid's outline. Uh, we'll have a couple ushers walk through. If we've missed you kids, sixth grade and below, you can raise your hand there. And uh, we, do, we do have tonight, after the evening service, uh, we have... Uh, 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 tri-tip sliders. They have some um, meal, they have a plate there, uh, some food. It's a youth fundraiser, and so if you'd like to stick around and enjoy the new courtyard and a little fellowship, um, that'll be a blessing. And uh, I think the cost for the meal is $10 per plate, and that's, uh, I don't know all that's a drink and some food. I'm not sure all that it includes, along with some tri-tip that was uh, smoked by one of our, by Brother Chad, one of our deacons, has uh, taking the time for hours that's been on the smoker should be delicious tonight and so I hope you'll stick around for a little fellowship and enjoy that and it'll be dark when we leave tonight it was almost dark when we came in and uh, as it's getting dark and we're having less natural light it is reminding me of how many uh, how, how much we need the new house lights that we are very close to getting um, just this week I had emails again we're waiting on some final revisions from the electrical contractor 
And it is, Steve, you work with stuff like this, and maybe not on as big of a scale of this building, but as big on electrical scale. Um, and Keith, you work on, those of you that work in construction, Todd, others. It's amazing how many details it takes to get just the whole infrastructure for a 30-year-old building. And if I walk you around, we have learned some things about this building in this process. There are wires going everywhere that people do not know what they're going to and where they came from. And if you go upstairs, there are pipes of wires. And so, Lord willing, when this is all done, we are going to have an updated, organized system and, and the new lighting and all of that. And I can't wait. I'm praying that we'll be working on that side of it. Uh, Lord willing, in the next month or two, we'll be starting with some of the house lights and some of the infrastructure, the, all of the conduit that has to run through all of this. And then after that, we'll be starting on the platform, the new sound system, the stage lighting. And so we're close. Um, we're, we're, it, it, it takes longer than expected, it seems. There's always more details, but we're getting there very, very quickly. We're getting close. And so I'm appreciative of that. And uh, it's going to brighten up our auditorium, especially on nights like this. We had one time when we had the uh, time change. And uh, kids were used to, families, we all walk in, and when we'd get out of church, it's always light. In the summer, it's still light at about 6.15 or so, 6.30 when church is over. And uh, one family walked in and on time change, and they walked out, and they said, man, pastor preached long tonight. It's already dark. And uh, I'm not planning to preach that long. It's just going to be dark because of time change. But uh, this Wednesday at 7, we will have uh, our family talk series. I'll be there. And then next Sunday, we're going to uh, celebrate Veterans Day. Veterans Day lands right in the middle of the week on Wednesday uh, November 11th, and so for those that have served um, in our armed forces, if you're able to, if you have uh, an outfit and you'd like to wear it, uh, we would or your, your uniform, I shouldn't say an outfit, your uniform, and would like to wear it, we'd encourage you to do that, and we'll look forward to honoring those that have served. Of course, this week, I mentioned it this morning, and I've mentioned it for several weeks, but be in prayer for our nation, and uh, pray that through all of this, through the elections, through all of these things, um, that uh, God would use it to turn people to Christ and to cause us to realize our need for Him. And as there's division and as there's, there's, there have been riots and, and all, a lot, even this past week or so, looting and all of those things, realizing uh, man doesn't have the answer for peace. We need the Prince of Peace. We need Christ. And as, as Christ comes into our lives and into our homes and into our cities, uh, things change. And so let's pray that through this we would be a light and folks would turn to Christ in this day. And uh, we'll look forward to that at this time. Brother Doug, I'm looking if I'm missing any announcements. Brother Doug is going to, uh, to sing a song. I enjoy hearing Doug sing this song. It's called My Tribute. Beautiful song. And then if you want to get your Bibles ready, we're going to jump right into 1 Samuel chapter number 9. We're going to jump into our second week of our series on the life of King Saul entitled Toxic Leadership. And we're looking, last week was the introduction week. Today is kind of still a little bit more of an introduction week as we kind of meet our, our subject, the one that we're going to study. So you listen to the song and then have your Bibles ready there, 1 Samuel chapter number 9. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved that you give to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be. it all to thee, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has. With his blood, 
let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With His blood, He has saved me by His power. Let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary with His blood. Thank you, all three of you. Appreciate that. Finish the statement for me tonight. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. We've heard that statement, right? Speaking of the power and importance of the way that we start something, someone once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. We talk often about the importance of a good start and and uh, some folks will say breakfast is the most important meal of the day, talking about getting your day off on the right foot. We all focus a lot on good starts to a career maybe, to a life, to work, a new job, and, and a good start. If a good start or first impressions were all that mattered, then Saul would have been the greatest king who ever lived. In this series on toxic leadership, as we study the life of Saul, tonight we're going to learn more about this man, and we're going to see the fact, and it's the title of the message tonight, that he had a good start. Saul had a good start, and if you haven't turned there yet, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 9. Last week we were in the entire chapter of 1 Samuel 8. We looked at every verse in 1 Samuel 8 last week, and the message entitled was entitled, Be Careful What You Wish For. And we told you we're studying the life of King Saul, and we actually didn't really mention King Saul at all. We just uh, looked at how did we get here? How did we get to the place where we had a King Saul? How did Israel get to the place that they were asking for a king? What was it that led to that? Was it God's plan or not? And we, we saw last week that it was never God's plan for Israel to have a king. God was, it was a theocracy. God ruled the nation of Israel, and that's how it was supposed to be. They were supposed to be different, but there were multiple reasons, and they wanted something different. They wanted to be like everybody else, and and for believers, for the children of God, it's a dangerous thing when we make decisions about our lives and our future because of what everyone else is doing or we want to be like everyone else. Parents, be careful even in, in, in raising children and teenagers and guiding them into the next step that we don't allow a, a human mentality, a human wisdom to creep in. Well, I want my kids to have, we, we should want our kids to do exactly what God wants them to do and to go exactly where God wants them to go and, and whatever that might look like and for every child that might be different. But be careful that the goal isn't we want to be like every other nation. We want, uh, God wants us to be a peculiar people. Now I've heard that said that, 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 that justifies us being some kind of strange weirdos. God didn't call Christians to be strange weirdos. That's a, that's a set apart people. That's a, a unique people. That's a special people. God wants us to be peculiar. Now because we use the word peculiar to mean something strange, we've applied that. But if you study that, that word out in the context that it's used, it's not the idea of God wants us to be strange. But he does, there is supposed to be something separated, set apart, sanctified is a Bible word for that about God's people. And 
And so they got in some trouble because they were not that peculiar people. They wanted to be like all the other nations. We didn't look at anything about King Saul last week, and, and today is, tonight is kind of our introduction into bringing King Saul into the story. We're going to get soon into his reign, into his family, into his decisions, into some of the things. And I told you last week, the purpose for this series, every leadership, someone defined leadership as influence. If you have influence in somebody's life, that, that is a form of leadership. Now there is organizational leadership, and we talked about all of that last week. Uh, but for all of us, in the areas that God has given us influence, are we leading in biblically, scripturally healthy and scriptural, God-pleasing ways, or are we leading in ways that are fleshly and, and carnal and toxic in our relationships? And so my goal is that we'll be able to identify some of these traits in King Saul's life, look at our own lives, and say, what's some of the toxic traits I've allowed into my life? And hopefully we can identify and improve, become more godly, biblical uh, Christians and, and leaders in our own lives. And then secondly, for us to be able to identify those that are influencing us and those that we have allowed influence and leadership into our lives and to be able to look a, according to biblical, scriptural uh, principles and say, is that, is that person... Is that a biblical influence, or is there some toxicity there that is not good for, for our lives, for our spiritual growth? And so today, this, tonight is our introduction to King Saul before he was King Saul, when he was just Saul. The events that led up to his anointing and his announcement as the first king of Israel. And we're going to walk through this passage in 1 Samuel 9. We're going to see some very admirable traits of Saul and then we'll glean a few applications at the end to our lives. At the end, I'm going to give you three statements at the end of the message to take with us as we consider Saul's life. As we jump into the, the, the text, I want you to see the attributes in King's life, King Saul's life at the start. And as you think about these things, I want you to think about what you know about King Saul. And does this sound like the same guy that you know of in a few chapters? And then we're going to talk a little bit and we'll see some as we continue to move through how, where and how he went wrong, getting away from some of these attributes. So I want to talk to us about a good start. What are the attributes? Let's jump into chapter 9, verse number 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was, what was his name, church? His name was Kish. So there's a guy, an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. His name is Kish. At the, the end of verse 1, it says he was a mighty man of power. Verse 2, and he had a son whose name was what? So at this point, and we're going to see here in a minute, the tribe of Benjamin was actually not the, not the most impressive, largest. It was actually kind of a, a small tribe. Was not, but there was a man of, 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 of the tribe of Benjamin. His name was, was uh, Kish, and he had a son by the name of Saul. What does it say about, about uh, King Saul in verse number 2? It says, Saul was a choice young man and a goodly. That's the idea of... of, of somewhat the way that he looked, the way that he carried himself, his attributes. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So what do we know about King Saul? We're, this is where he gets introduced to the, to, the God, to the Bible narrative. This is where King Saul gets introduced to us. What do we know about him? First thing I would say to you, and the attributes of King Saul, the first one I see is he was pretty impressive. The Bible says he was a choice young man. If you were, you were looking, we need somebody to be a leader, somebody that's got the attributes, somebody that's somewhat impressive. The one that stood out was King Saul, was not King Saul, was Saul. This young man, he was a choice young man. He was goodly, the Bible says goodlier than the other. He stood head and shoulders above the rest. Where One of the places where we get that, that, uh, that, that turn of phrase that we use, that cliche, he stands head and shoulders above the rest, carrying along the idea of that guy, he's the cream of the crop. Well, that's, it comes from Saul here in 1 Samuel 9. He was impressive. Let's continue on in, in verse number 3. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servants that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought of us or for us. What do we see about King Saul? 
and we could, I didn't put this as a point, but you could say he was one that his father trusted when he had a job, son, go do this. He was, he was a trustworthy son. But what I see here, an attribute of King Saul, is he was selfless. His dad says, hey, son, we've, and at that time, your, your crops, your animals, that was your, your, your life, your livelihood. Hey, son, we, we've got something wrong in the business. We lost some, some valuable assets. Can you go see where they are? And they went on this journey, several-day journey. They're gone and trying to find them. They can't find them. And King Saul, what does he say? We need to get back because if not, my, if my dad's going to stop worrying about the donkeys. He's going to start worrying about me. He's going to start worrying that we've died, that something bad has happened to us. And, and again, when we compare and contrast King Saul to this Saul, this, this Saul was a man that was not thinking only about himself. He was thinking about others. That's not going to be the Saul we're going to study in a little bit. Something changed, but here, his, his concern was, I don't, want to, I don't want to worry my dad. I don't want to bring a burden to my dad. I don't want to hurt my family. Again, think about the King Saul that we know. He didn't care about hurting his family in some ways. But here, he's a man that says, we've got to get back because my, dad, uh, my dad's going to be, be concerned. Verse number six. And he said unto him, his, his servant said unto him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God. And he's an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. So Saul says, hey, you know what? We lost the donkeys. At this point, my dad, he's going he's gonna to be scared to death. And we're going to cause more problems than the lost donkeys. we got to get back. And his servant said, you know what? I know in this city there's a man of God. It was Samuel, the prophet. There's somebody here, and whatever he says, it comes to pass. This guy knows God. This, this man is amazing. This, 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 the, the priest, uh, Samuel, let's go and see if we can find him and see what he says. He might know where our donkeys are. Verse number, uh, verse number uh, six, I'm sorry, seven. Then said Saul to his servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again, Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So he just introduces it because they're going to call him a seer in a minute. That it wasn't some spooky, it was just the prophet of God. And what I see here with Saul is, again, number three, what's an attribute of, of when he's being introduced to us? He was respectful. Well, I, I don't know. What, we don't have any, we, that's not appropriate to go to somebody of his position. It would be disrespectful for us to go. We don't have any gift to bring to him. He was not worried about himself. He was worried about others. What, what would be the right thing to do? If we're going to go see the prophet, we're going to go see the priest, we're going to go see Samuel, we've got to bring him a gift. We don't have any gift. What are we going to do? So they figured that out. Notice verse number 10. Then said Saul to his servant, well said. Come, let us go. Okay, we got a gift. Let's go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was, and as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here, or the priest, the prophet? They answered them and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city. For there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. And as soon as you come into the city, you, you shall go straightway. Uh, you shall straightly find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice. And afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time you shall find him. And, and they went up into the city. And when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Number four, what I see about Saul, he was, I, I, I wrote down here, he was spiritual. He was at least willing to consider what the prophet, the man of God, had to say. He was willing to to seek his counsel and listen to it. By the way, we're going to see here later on in the coming weeks in Saul's life, he didn't care about what the prophet had to say. He didn't care about the prophet's timelines. He didn't care about... But here, his servant said, let's go talk to the, to the man of God. Let's go talk to the priest. Let's go talk to the prophet, the seer. And Saul could have said, if he had no spiritual desires, if he didn't have any respect for the things of God, he could have said, that's a bunch of hogwash. We're How's that guy going to know where our, where our donkeys went? We know our donkeys better than him. We, we, we've called their names. We've walked through these mountains. How is he going to tell us, what are you talking about? But we see that this King Saul didn't know everything and believed that there were some spiritual influences that could help guide him. And he says, let's go. And so they come and they say, hey, is, is, is Samuel here? They said, 
it's your lucky day. He just got here today. He just got to town. And they're about to have sacrifices. Get in there quick, because uh, if you don't get in there quick, he's going to go up, and they're going to start eating, and it's going to be a bit festivity. You're going to have a hard time talking to him. Get in there, and as he walked in, there he was. They ran into each other. Notice verse number 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me. I see he was a young man of potential. God said, Tomorrow, Samuel, you're going to meet somebody that's going to do great things for Israel. By the way, what a beautiful verse that reminds us of God's love and mercy. Because King Saul was actually a fruit of the rebellion of the people. They weren't supposed to have a king. But even in our failures, God still loves us and hears us. Now that doesn't justify being rebels against God, but what it does show us is that God still loves us. He said, I've heard the cry of my people. Even though they're asking for a king, and I'm not happy about that. I've heard the cry, and God has plans to use King Saul greatly. Look at verse 17, and we'll we'll finish all this. And I don't have to be long tonight, but this is all by way of introduction, and then I'm going to give us a few thoughts on King Saul's life. Verse 17, and when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. God said, Samuel, when Samuel saw him, here comes this guy, taller than everybody else, good looking, impressive. And he comes, he's walking up, and God says to Samuel, there he is. That's the king you're going to anoint. Verse number 18. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. He doesn't know that he's talking to Samuel. Do you know where where Samuel's staying at? Do you know where that, I'm looking for the prophet guy, the guy that he hears things from God, and then he tells the people, and it comes to pass. Do you know where that guy is? Do you know where he lives? Do you know where he's staying? I'd like to go over and see him. Verse 19, and Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Oh, fancy meeting you here. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? That's a pretty heavy verse. Hey, you, you look like you kind of know what's going on around here. Excuse me, sir. You know where the prophet's at? I heard he's in town today. Yeah, that's me. Oh, well, good. You're the guy I want to talk to. I wanted to ask you, stop. Just head on up, get a seat where I'm sitting, where I'm eating today. You're going to eat with me. And oh, by the way, Saul hasn't even asked about his donkey. Oh, by the way, those donkeys you've been looking for for three days, I'm going to tell you where they're at. I've got that under control. And then I'm going to tell you everything that's in your heart, all the things you're worried about and concerned about. And by the way, basically what he says is, um, the whole hope of, of Israel rests on your shoulders. And Saul's like, what? I was just looking for a few lost donkeys. What just happened? What, what's going on here? And, and we see as Saul is coming, his life is about to change. And here's this, this impressive, selfless, respectful, somewhat spiritual man, young man of potential. And his life's about to change. Notice another characteristic in verse 21. Would you read verse 21 together? First Samuel 9, verse 21 aloud. Ready? Begin. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? What do we see about Saul? He was a young man of humility. He says, when you read that, doesn't it sound like Gideon? It's amazing how the mightily used people of God are often those that don't think much of themselves. By the way, the Bible says God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. God is looking for people that say, it's not me, it's not my strength, it's not my talent, it's not my skill, but God, whatever I, the, 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 the filthy rags that I have, I give them to you, and you can, you do what you want to with them. And, and he says, his response to that, hey, go up and sit with me, and we're going to have lunch. His response to that is, I think you got the wrong guy. I, I don't know what's going on here. I just got to town. This doesn't sound like the right thing. I'm of the smallest tribe, and if you were to come to our small tribe that nobody cares about, our family is like the least of the whole tribe. You couldn't find 
a, a more unimpressive family to be to be bringing up to eat with you and the stuff you're talking about all the hope of Israel and and here it is Saul and again those of you that know the story of King Saul I can't help but but think about just a few chapters later in chapter 15 what is Samuel going to tell Saul he's gonna say when thou wast little in thine own sight God blessed you and anointed you and used you when you were nobody but now you've gotten lifted up in pride and he's gonna take the kingdom from you by the way when when we are uh, when, when we are uh, understand who we are as I talked about with Isaiah today who he is holy 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 who I am a man of unclean lips God says there's someone I can use when we start to when we start reading our own press yeah I, I am pretty impressive aren't I I'm, I'm pretty good at that and I'm a pretty good singer and I'm a pretty good uh, I'm, I've got a pretty pretty good personality I'm pretty successful in business and I've I've done pretty well for myself financially and look at what have I, I've achieved and look at who I am and look at my family and when we start doing that that is generally speaking the beginning of the end at least in our usefulness in God's sight he was humble look at verse 22 and Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the cheapest place among them that were bidden which were about 30 persons when I read the Bible I love to try to put myself in it I picture this guy from this unknown kid named Saul this unknown young man named Saul walking into town he literally has been walking for three days he was looking for donkeys he was getting ready to go home his servant said I heard there's a priest that knows a whole bunch of stuff let's go talk to him he gets there and this guy now says and he's in the chief place everybody's there they're getting ready, and he's looking around like how did I get here what is going on and and he's, he's worried about which fork to use and which which napkin goes in his lap and and what's the soup spoon and all of those things and and he comes to verse look at verse number 23 and Samuel said unto the cook Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder. I think that's, that may be in the, in the Hebrew, that's the tri-tip slider there that's after church tonight. The cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, I set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And... When they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out both uh, of them and Samuel abroad. I want you to see we're almost done. I'm going to just read a few more verses into chapter 10, and, and that'll be where we'll be for our, our passage today, and then I'll give you a few applications. But I want you to see in, in verse 27, And as they were going down, to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, bid the servant pass on before us. What are the next four words? And he passed on. I want you to see that. But stand thou still a while that I may show thee the word of God. Stay here. Uh, your servant can go home. You need to stay here. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed to be thee to be captain over his inheritance? Again, I have to imagine Saul is thinking, what is going on? What are you talking about? He's pouring oil over him. He, verse 2, when thou art departed from me today, when thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin and Zelza, and they will say unto thee, the asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and sorroweth for you, saying, what shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God, to Bethel, and one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine, and they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. I picture Saul like, what, now what, I don't know about you, when I get directions from somebody back before GPS, like, what was that again? Okay, right there and left there, so I'm supposed to go here, and there's a guy, okay, I'm looking for three, I'm getting three, three kids and, and three loaves of bread, or two, what is it again? He's writing it all, here's where you're going to go, you're going to go there, verse 5, and after that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it, it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and 
Behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. What do I see? And we could pull out other characteristics, but the last one I'll give you tonight. As a young man at a start, he was obedient. He did what the Spirit of God led him to do. He listened to the Word of God. He listened. And sometimes we as pastors, we can we can manipulate and say, you know, basically anything we say is the oracles of God. That's not the case. I, I'm, I'm a, a man. But he listened to the words of the man of God. And again, sometimes pastors have used that to, to manipulate and control people's lives. That's not what I mean by that. But God does give us spiritual leaders. And if we're preaching the truths of God as God's people, we ought to listen. And that is what Samuel did. I'm Saul did. When he heard the word of God and the spirit of God, God gave him another heart and God's spirit was on him. We're going to see later on where God's spirit is removed from him. God's spirit was on him and, and when he listened to the words of the man of God and, and allowed that to help guide his life, what do we see that in the Bible, by the way, he started, he was able to do things he didn't think he could do. A few verses before in, in chapter 9, what did he say? I'm nobody. I'm the least. My family's the least of the smallest tribe. And now what's he doing? He's standing up, having been anointed by, by, by uh, uh, Samuel. And what is he doing? He's prophesying now. God's given him another heart. God has opened a new door of life and service and ministry. Skip down to chapter 10. Let's read the last verse. Chapter 10, verse 24. Let's read this. This will be the last verse that we look at here. Would you read it aloud with me? Ready? Begin. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Sound like a good start, church? Yes or no? Pretty good start. Selected by God, blessed by the man of God, obedient to the words of God. He was an impressive young man externally. God had given him a good heart, the spirit of God. He was selfless, thought of others. He was respectful, what was appropriate for certain situations. He was a spiritual young man. He had a man of great potential. He was a humble man. Sounds like a great start. And in the coming weeks, again, last week and this week, really some introduction to kind of bring us in to understand who we're studying. In the coming weeks, we're going to get into some of the ugly details of Saul's life, of his family, of his actions. As we study the events of the years that would follow this chapter we just read today. But for now, what do we have? We have an impressive, selfless, thoughtful, respectful, spiritual young man with great potential who was humble and obedient and on the right track. We know the end, and we're going to study some of it. What can we glean for our lives today? And here's the message. I don't need to be long. I'm going to give you three statements. What can we glean from this today? Number one, a good start is good. A good finish is better. A good start is good. A good finish is better. And may I say, church family, if you can only choose one, choose a good finish. Here's the reality. That is actually the only choice that is within our power at this point. We cannot, we cannot make up for whether our start in life or our start as a Christian or our start as, as a mom or a dad or a family member or whatever it was. We cannot go back in time. We cannot control the start we were given or the start that we had because of our own choices. We can only control how we will finish from this day forward. A good start is good, but a good finish is better. This is true in every area of our lives, and by the way, a good start, we'll get to it in a minute, but a, a good start doesn't guarantee a good finish, and, and I'll, I'll get to that point here in a minute, but, but in our careers, how many Ivy League graduates, college graduates have gone on to ruin their lives or find themselves uh, destitute, and how many high school dropouts have gone on to great business success? A good, I'm not against getting a good college degree or a master's degree or whatever God leads you to do. A good start can be good in our careers, but a good finish is better. More important than where we've been is what we're going to do from this day forward. 
in relationships. How many people have started out uh, with, with that picture-perfect life and that maybe that picture-perfect honeymoon or that wedding that cost tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars only to see those relationships crumble? And how many maybe went to the justice of the peace or had the simplest start go on to live a life of love for 40 or 50 or 60 years and longer in Christianity? How many children were born into the church in Sunday school every week? 13 years of Christian education choose to walk away from God, giving Him no thought in their lives for their futures. And then how many have never stepped foot in a Christian school as a student? Didn't find Christ until their 20s or 30s or 40s. And yet they have gone on, and some in this room, faithfully living for God decades later today. Oh, I'm thankful for those children that have been born into the church. I'm thankful for the teenagers that I see sitting in different sections all over that your parents have, have brought you up in Sunday school and they have you here today two times on a Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night. And, and, and for some, they've made a decision to place you into a Christian school or whatever it might be. I'm thankful for the good start you've been given. And that's a blessing, but a good finish is far better and far more important in your life. A good start is good. By the way, those that got saved later in life, in their 20s or 30s or later, would tell you they wish they had the good start that some of you kids have had. They wish they had some of that, and, and what you view in your life as, ah, this is, ah, why do we have to do this, and why do I have to go there, and why, why, and they say, man, I wish I would have had that. But the reality is a good start is good, but way more important is how are you going to finish? How are you going to take what's been invested into your life and live it for God? Sometimes, Christian, we allow our lack of a good start in some area to convince us that a good finish is out of our reach. Well, I didn't have that head start that so-and-so had. I didn't grow up in that kind of family. I didn't know about the Bible and those things until I was older. I didn't grow up as a Christian. I, I have that regret, and I've made that mistake, and I've messed up there, and I, I have that scar and that failure in my past. And because of that, because of the, what we feel has been maybe a bad start in our lives, we, we then allow that to define our future for God. My whole future is bleak. I want to say tonight, church family, a good start is good, but a good finish is better. And you can't control what has happened to this point forward, but you can control how you finish. Because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you're here tonight, you're not finished yet. And Satan loves to condemn you and say, look at what you've done. You've messed it up. You can't fix that, and you can't get over that, and that will never be right, and you can't, you can't make up for that, and, and God couldn't use you in that way because how, how could somebody do something like that? And we allow our past to, to convince us that God could never use us in our future. By the way, church, you say, well, is there anybody in the Bible that kind of had that bad start, that had some regrets, that had some mistakes, that had some failures, and God used them in great ways? You don't have to go any farther than the man that had the exact same name as this guy, but in the New Testament. He wasn't King Saul, he was the Apostle Saul. Well, he started as Persecutor Saul. He sure didn't have a good start in the things of God, in, in the things of Christ. And yet, what did he have? A terrible start, but what did he have? He had a great finish. He's the one that says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. Which Saul would you rather be? The good start and bad finish? And by the way, if you can have a good start and a good, I think I mentioned it this morning of, of Brother Leonard Young, and he would tell you that if he were here today, that I'm sure he had some regrets and some mistakes and some failures in his life. But a good start and a good finish is the best case scenario. There was a man that was born into the nursery of a Bible-believing church in Long Beach as a, his family brought him up all the way through. And when he went to heaven, uh, he, he went to heaven this morning having been a faithful Christian. Not a perfect Christian, but a faithful Christian his entire life. But if that's not your story, which one would you rather be? King Saul, good start, bad finish? Or bad start, good finish? What did, what, did, what did the Apostle Paul say? He said about his life, forgetting those things which are, talk to me church, are what? Behind. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are before, I press 
toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going forward for God. I'm not looking back with regret. I'm not looking back with pride. Look at the good things I've done. Look at the bad things I've done. I'm not looking. What am I doing? I'm pressing toward the mark. I, I have a place that I want to go. I want God to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I, what did he say in another place? But none of these things move me that so that I might finish my course with what? Joy. That was, my, that was Paul's passion. I don't just want to have, have known God and served him for a year or five or ten or twenty. I don't just want to have planted a few churches and reached a few thousand people. I don't just want God to have used me here. Not as though I had already attained. I haven't, I haven't finished this course. Neither were already perfect, he said. I haven't finished yet, but I'm trying to finish right. And my passion, my plea with you this evening, Christian, is to ask God to give you a burden, teenager, to give you a passion that you won't just have a few good years of, of growing up in the church or adult Christian that you served God in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s or your 50s or your 60s or 70s and then walked away at the end before God called you home. No, that you and I would be faithful unto death. You know the story of the Olympic marathon runner from Tanzania. That story in the 60s, he went and had the, 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 the fall and the injury. It took him way longer than everyone else. And what did he say? My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to what? Finish the race. God wants us to finish the race he's called us to. Saul had a great start. Christian, take your eyes off of your past and keep your eyes on the finish line. I have finished my course. That is the goal, not just a good start. Not only... Not only do I see a good start is good, but a good finish is better. Number two, I see a good start is no guarantee of a good finish. A good start is no guarantee of a good finish. Good men can and do go bad. Good churches can corrupt. Good Christians can apostatize. Don't rest on past victories, on past accomplishments, or on past success. Good families, good godly Christian families can have nothing to do with God in the course of a short period of time. As a dad, as a mom, as a friend, as a Christian, a good start is not enough. A good finish requires daily victories. What did Paul say? I die daily. Every day I wake up and say, God, I need you today. One of the reasons I believe that Paul was able to finish with joy and to finish hearing well done from God was because of the fact that he understood I have to win these victories with God's strength every day in my life. In your marriage, in ministry, in relationships, in careers, a good finish requires daily victories. Complacency and pride are the enemies of this and they'll lead us to bad finishes. Bad decisions can destroy a great start. Young people that, that your parents are passionate. The fact, if there are any young people under 18 that are in church tonight, the fact that you're here is an indicator that someone in your life wishes and wants for you, and maybe it's you in your life, wants you to, to have a good finish, to grow to know God, to love God, to live for God for a lifetime. But bad decisions in your life can destroy a great start. How many times have we seen it happen? A young person, a middle-aged person, an older person that had a great run, if you will, and got off track, went the wrong direction. I was thinking about this week as I thought about King Saul, where he started so well and ended so poorly. I thought about, I enjoy sports, I thought about a young man who was drafted in the first round of the 2004 NBA draft. His name is Delonte West. He played, I think it's St. John's in New York. First round, he, he made it to the peak of his profession. If you make it in the NBA, you're in the top fraction of 1% of the best basketball players on the planet of seven plus billion people. You have made it to the peak of your profession. To be drafted in the first round, he was the 24th overall draft pick, is an even higher accomplishment. He played nearly a decade. He played with and against some of the greatest players to ever play the game. His professional career spanned about a decade and in salary, not to mention any other endorsements, he made about $14 million. That's not a bad decade's work, Steve, is it? Take me and you a couple decades to get there, but he did it in about a decade. 14 million. And that wasn't not counting any endorsements. He played 
in front of tens of thousands of fans screaming and cheering his name. Here's a picture of him in 2020. He has struggled with addictions, with mental health disorders. I don't say this gleefully. He's been homeless for quite some time now. He's been seen panhandling. He's been in and out of rehab. He's penniless. In January, that picture on the left was a video somebody caught as a homeless, he was the homeless man, and somebody was beating him up on the streets of Dallas. This was a man that would walk into stadiums and tens of thousands would cheer, had millions in his bank account, had made it to the peak of his career. Just last month, he was picked up from a gas station in Texas by Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban's the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Delonte West had played for Mark Cuban at one point, and he was picked up from a gas station. He's, he was on drugs, and Mark Cuban vowed to try to help him get the help that he needs. How does that happen, a multimillionaire professional athlete to a homeless, mentally ill drug addict? Obviously, there are a variety of reasons, but the power of sin and the destruction of daily choices that lead us down a wrong path. By the way, something like that happens in private far before it ever happens in public. In your life and in mine, decisions of regret and destruction in our lives, they happen in private that where no one sees it far beyond, far before the public shame and the public example is made. Stories like that, Delonte West, could be told in politics, a good start and a shameful finish. They could be told in business, a great start and a shameful businessmen, CEOs, multimillionaires landing in jail for decades. They could be told in families, you know of people, and I know of people, unfortunately. They could be told of churches. Stories like this, anywhere that you find humans, we can find good starts that completely unravel. And sometimes we see a Christian that we respected who destroy their lives in some terrible way, and we think, I wonder how that happened. May I just say, it's almost never just one decision or one event. I heard it said one time regarding the big blow-ups of, of disgraceful, shameful things, whether it's in, in Christianity, in churches, in politics, and wherever. I heard it said before, there are no blowouts in the Christian life, only slow leaks. Small decisions that lead us. We, we get involved in that relationship we get, shouldn't get involved with. We start sending that text message we shouldn't send. We start watching that video online we shouldn't watch. We download that app that we shouldn't download. We, we listen to that entertainment that we shouldn't listen to. We get involved in the priorities of making uh, our priority of pleasure or finances more important than God and His work and His service and these small decisions. And then lastly, let me finish it up. Number three, toxic leaders can start well. This is a cautionary tale for all, for all of us. We see King Saul as this terrible leader at the end. He started well. So that you know what that means? But for the grace of God, there go I. Toxic leaders can start well. Godly leaders finish well. And so here's the challenge to you this evening. How will you finish? If you're still here, you're not finished. Your final story isn't written yet. Don't let it be like King Saul. He started so well. Don't let it be said, she started so well. She was right where God wanted her to be, and then, and by the way, you say, so when I mess up, does that mean that I didn't finish well? No, that means you stumbled in the middle. We all stumble in the middle. We all have mistakes and faults and failures and regrets and things that we messed up or we hurt someone or someone hurt us. We all have those things. But the question is, how are we going to finish in spite of those things? Church family, walk with God. Stay humble. Stay obedient. Stay selfless. He was doing, Saul was, great things for God. And then it crumbled. Teenager, don't let it be said that your parents gave you a good start. Let it be said that you stayed faithful unto death. Christian marriages, let us not just have a good start. Let us show the love of Christ uh, to the church until death do us part. Church members, don't let people say, remember when so-and-so used to be so in love with God and so on fire for God. Let them say, he fought a good fight. He finished his course. He kept the faith. Christian, don't follow the path of Saul. In the Old Testament, follow the path of Saul who became Paul in the New Testament. I leave you tonight with this passage. Paul, in talking to the church at Corinth, he had gotten, they had gotten off track in some ways. Paul had this to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you put that first passage up there? Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, 
and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. Read, see that last, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who, church? What is that passage saying? He's talking to the church. By the way, Christ, Christ was in the Old Testament. Christ is all through the Old Testament. He's saying, church at Corinth, I don't want you to be like your fathers. And what did your fathers do? They had a great start. God delivered them. Picture of salvation. Delivered them out of Egypt. God brought them through the Red Sea. God, the, the miracles God miraculously provided for them. They, they had great victory in their life. Your fathers had a great start. Next passage, if you will. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Why? For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. What did he say? Don't be like King Saul. They had a great start and what happened? They all destroyed their lives. How did they do it? With wrong decisions, fleshly decisions, looking at what's for me, my pleasure, my play, my, my, my sinful lusts, what's going to make my life feel better. And they said they got their focus on themselves instead of their focus on what God had for them. And what did he say? Those that had such a good start, church at Corinth, beware. And he said, these were for our example. You started following God and God did great things for you. He opened the Red Sea. But before you know it, you weren't living for God. You were living for yourself. And then the last passage. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Would you read that sentence with me aloud? Starting with wherefore. Ready, begin. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. In context, what is Paul telling the church at Corinth? He said, uh, your fathers, God gave them a great start. They destroyed their lives with sinful, fleshly, uh, worldly, pleasure-filled decisions. And he said, these were written for our example. While you're walking for, living for God, while you're walking with God, Christians at Corinth, while you're trying to fulfill God's plan for your life, guess what's going to happen? There are going to be some temptations that come into your life that get you off track. There are going to be some things that come into your heart, some relationships, some, for, some, some temptations for physical uh, pleasure, for lust, for, for, for adding to yourself uh, material goods, eating and drinking and play. He said those things are coming, but what does he say? There is no temptation that's taken you, that such as is common to man. God, what is he saying? God can give you the strength to finish well. They started well. They finished wrong. Some of them, not all of them. He said some of them in Corinthians. But God can help you finish well. We see with Saul, we're going to get into some of his leadership traits in the coming weeks. But what we see here to start with was a good start. In your life and in mine, a good start is no guarantee of a good finish. A good start is good, but a good, a, a good finish is better. And toxic leaders can have a good start. You say, well, I'm doing well right now. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. But God can give you the strength to resist those temptations and to stay faithful to God for a lifetime. Godly leaders finish well. Church, I guess my plea to you today is, whether you're an elementary student, a teenager, a uh, single, a young young married, middle-aged, senior citizen, my challenge and plea to all of us is, let's do our best to finish well. Lord, I pray that we would take these thoughts and apply them to our lives. 
I thank you as we study King Saul, God, he started so well. We looked at just seven of the attributes from that chapter today, but we could have pulled out multiple others. God, there was such a bright future ahead of King Saul. But yet, he ended in destruction and in disgrace. And God, you gave us those things in the Old Testament there for our examples, Paul said, because the same thing can happen to us. We can end in heartache and heartbreak, disgrace, destruction. I pray that tonight, dear God, you would help all of us. Maybe there are some that they know they've allowed some private secret sins in their life that nobody else knows about. They've allowed those things in, and God, maybe tonight you're convicting them that they'll begin to seek with your help to get victory in that area so that it doesn't end in destruction. That, Lord, we can finish our course with joy. We can fight a good fight. And God, if we're still here, it means you're not done with us yet. doesn't mean any of us are going to run a perfect race. The Apostle Paul didn't run a perfect race, and nobody ever has, except for Christ. But God, we can run a good race with your strength, and we can finish our race. I pray that we would. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand. The piano plays. If God has spoken, the altar is open. If you'd like to come and pray, and maybe you want to come and ask God to help you to finish well. You can't control the hurts, the heartaches, the scars of the past. You can control how you walk forward from this day forward till God calls you home. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, let us know. The altar is open if anybody would like to come forward and pray or pray there at your seat. Lord, I thank you for each one that's in this room right now. I don't believe they'd be back on a Sunday night if their desire wasn't to finish well. I pray that you'd bind Satan in our lives. God, that you'd give us victory over our flesh. God, you'd help us to resist temptation with your strength. That, Lord, we would seek help where we need it. So that one day, unlike Saul, we'd be able to finish our course with joy. I pray that those in this room, dear God, would understand that past mistakes don't have to define our future. Help us to walk forward in grace and the forgiveness that you've offered to us, in the love and the mercy, the long-suffering of Christ. And God, help us to seek to be that child of God that would, Lord, not just do well for a season and then fade away, but God would stay faithful unto death in the path that you've called us to. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being here tonight. I did mention this morning we took an offering at the end of the service to be a help to the young family during this season. If you weren't here this morning or you would like to give toward that, if you put it in an envelope, just mark on there young family or junior young, something of that nature, and you can drop it in the offering plate. If you give online, you can choose other and, uh, and then just de uh, um, designate it uh, for the young family. 100% of what came in on the plates this morning and what comes in um, designated for that on any offering envelopes or online will go directly to help with some of the expenses, final medical expenses and insurance and obviously some final expenses for this transition. And uh, financially, it's been a very, very tough season for their family the last two years as Leonard lost his full-time job when he had that stroke about two and a half years ago. And uh, the Lord has provided for them, but it's not been easy at all. So anything we can do on that, that level, I see that in Scripture in the New Testament. They helped one another when there was a financial need like that. And I'll just tell you, they're not sitting on any kind of a nest egg. And so anything that our church could do to be an encouragement in that way, uh, I, I believe the Lord would honor. And so if you'd like to give toward that, you can. Again, just 
put it on an envelope and jot their name down, put it in the offering box, um, the young family, or online and designate it there. This time, I'd encourage you, if, you, if you're able to, uh, stick around, enjoy a little fellowship, enjoy the beautiful evening in the courtyard. We'll have some delicious tri-tip sliders and some, si- I'm not sure, the sides or the chips or whatever it is, and drinks there. And then Wednesday night, we'll be back together on Wednesday at 7 for our Family Talk series. And the next Sunday, we'll, we'll celebrate the Veterans Sunday, and I'll continue to preach through the book of Acts. Thank you for being faithful to God's house all day. You're an encouragement to Tiffany and to me. We, we thank the Lord for the privilege to serve with you. Have a great night. God bless you. Thank you.